Welcome to our educational series on dog behavior with renowned canine behaviorist Tony Nila. Hello, I'm Tony Nila, and today we're diving into the fascinating world of dog behavior and how our understanding of it has evolved over time. Are you ready to learn something new about your furry friend? Let's get started. Once upon a time, scientists like John B. Watson back in 1913 believed our behaviors were solely shaped by our environment. Imagine being born as a blank slate, with knowledge being poured into you. This theory, known as behaviorism, was the foundation of understanding behavior for years. But here's the twist. In the 1950s, scientists realized a crucial flaw in behaviorism. We aren't born empty. Our genetic makeup plays a significant role in our behavior. Behavioral genetics shows us that certain instincts are hardwired into us. A baby knows to cry for its mother, and a spider instinctively knows how to spin a web. This is the wisdom nature embeds in us. So what does this mean for our dogs? It means understanding their behavior isn't just about training, it's about recognizing their innate abilities and instincts. Join me as we explore more about this fascinating topic, and learn how to better understand and connect with our canine companions. Stay tuned for more insights with Tony Nila and discover the amazing world of dog behavior. Ever wondered how a pet learns to follow commands or how a child learns to associate actions with consequences? Well, you're in the right place. Today we delve into the captivating world of operant conditioning, a cornerstone of behaviorism and cognitive science, a field that revolutionized our understanding of learning. We'll explore their concepts, applications, and impact, as well as their limitations that led to significant shifts in psychological paradigms. So, buckle up as we embark on this fascinating journey of learning and understanding. Now, let's dive right into the world of operant conditioning. When we think about learning, we often consider it as the acquisition of new knowledge or skills. But B.F. Skinner, a renowned psychologist, saw it differently. Back in the 1930s, he introduced a concept that he referred to as operant conditioning. This idea suggests that learning is a result of the consequences that follow our actions. Imagine this scenario. You're in an arcade, and you're playing a game that rewards you with tickets. Every time you score, you get tickets. The more you score, the more tickets you receive. This is a simple example of operant conditioning. The game rewards you for successful actions, thereby encouraging you to repeat them. Skinner took this concept further by introducing the idea of rewards and punishments. He suggested that if an action is followed by a rewarding consequence, we are more likely to repeat it. This is known as positive reinforcement. On the other hand, if an action leads to an unfavorable outcome, we are less likely to repeat it. This is referred to as punishment. Skinner also distinguished between two types of reinforcements and punishments, positive and negative. Positive reinforcement involves adding a rewarding stimulus, like getting extra dessert for doing chores. Negative reinforcement, on the other hand, involves removing an unpleasant stimulus, like turning off an annoying alarm by waking up on time. Similarly, Positive punishment involves adding an unpleasant stimulus like a scolding for misbehavior, while negative punishment involves taking away a pleasant stimulus, like losing phone privileges for breaking rules. So in essence, operant conditioning is all about learning through the consequences of our actions. It's a fascinating concept that has had profound implications on how we understand and influence behavior. Whether it's training a dog to sit, encouraging students to study, or even understanding addiction, operant conditioning continues to play a crucial role. But like all theories, it's not without its limitations, which we'll discuss later on. For now, let's marvel at the simplicity and power of Skinner's operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is not just a theory, it has practical applications too. It's a key player in the world of psychology and extends its influence into various fields, shaping our behaviors in ways we may not even realize. Let's take a closer look. In education, Teachers often use operant conditioning to encourage good behavior and discourage bad ones. Remember those star charts in kindergarten? You'd get a gold star for each day you came to school on time. That's operant conditioning in action. The gold star is a positive reinforcement encouraging you to repeat the behavior. But it doesn't stop at school. Operant conditioning plays a significant role in the workplace too. Ever heard of employee incentive programs? They're essentially a form of operant conditioning. Employees are rewarded for reaching certain targets or displaying desired behaviors. These rewards serve as positive reinforcements, motivating employees to maintain or improve their performance. 
Now let's switch gears to the realm of animal training. Ever wondered how circus animals perform those incredible tricks or how pets are trained to follow commands? You guessed it, operant conditioning, animal trainers use rewards and punishments to shape behavior, teaching animals to associate certain actions with positive or negative consequences. Even in our personal lives, operant conditioning is at work. Think about your fitness goals. Maybe you've set up a reward system where you treat yourself to something nice each time you hit a milestone. That's your personal operant conditioning system motivating you to stay on track. But what's the impact of all this? While operant conditioning can significantly influence our behaviors, shaping our actions based on the consequences we anticipate, it can help us form good habits, reach our goals, and generally function better in society. Thus, operant conditioning has a profound impact on our daily lives, shaping our behaviors and actions. Whether we're aware of it or not, it's an integral part of how we learn, grow, and navigate the world around us. However, like any other theory, operant conditioning too has its limitations. As insightful as B.F. Skinner's concept may be, it's not a one-size-fits-all answer to every behavioral challenge. There are certain aspects that operant conditioning fails to consider, leading to a few notable shortcomings. The first drawback arises from the excessive reliance on rewards and punishments. When we constantly use rewards to reinforce behavior, we run the risk of creating an over-dependency on these external factors. For instance, if a child is always given a candy for cleaning their room, they may start to expect a reward for every act of responsibility. This can diminish their intrinsic motivation, the inherent desire to do things for the sheer satisfaction of accomplishment. Similarly, the use of punishment as a deterrent can create an atmosphere of fear and stress, which may not always lead to the desired behavioral changes. Instead, it can result in attempts to avoid punishment rather than understanding and correcting the behavior itself. Another pitfall of operant conditioning is its potential to encourage manipulative or even unethical behaviors. If the reward is enticing enough, individuals might resort to dishonest means to achieve it. It's like a student cheating on a test to get good grades, the very reward system could inadvertently promote deceitful actions. Operant conditioning also tends to oversimplify the complexity of human behavior by focusing solely on observable actions and immediate reactions. It fails to account for cognitive processes like thoughts, emotions, and memories, which play a crucial role in shaping our behavior. This lack of consideration for the internal mental state is a significant limitation. Furthermore, Operant conditioning assumes that all responses are equal, which isn't always the case. Different individuals can respond differently to the same stimulus based on their personal experiences and interpretations. Therefore, while operant conditioning is useful, it's important to be aware of its limitations. It's a powerful tool in understanding and influencing behavior, but like all tools, it must be used wisely and appropriately, taking into account its potential drawbacks and the unique individuality of each person. Recognizing these limitations led to a shift in focus towards cognitive science. The story of cognitive science begins in the mid-20th century, when psychologists started to question the narrow lens of behaviorism. They began to realize that behaviorism, with its focus on observable actions, was leaving out an essential piece of the puzzle. Behaviorism couldn't account for the rich complexity of human thought, memory, and problem-solving. This realization marked a turning point. The tide began to turn away from operant conditioning and towards cognitive science. The shift wasn't abrupt. It was more like a gradual sea change, with the waves of thought and research slowly eroding the stronghold of behaviorism and revealing a new landscape of understanding. And what was this new landscape? It was a place where the mind's inner workings were seen as crucial to understanding behavior. Cognitive science looked beyond the surface of observable actions to explore the intricate patterns of thought, memory, and problem-solving that underpin our actions. The shift to cognitive science was driven by several reasons. One was the growing body of evidence that cognitive processes play a crucial role in learning. Studies showed that our thoughts, memories, and problem-solving abilities are intimately involved in how we learn and behave. Another reason was the desire for a more holistic understanding of behavior. Cognitive science offered a way to look at the whole person, not just their actions. It allowed psychologists to explore the interplay between thought and action, between the mind and the world. And so cognitive science began to take root, promising a more comprehensive understanding of human behavior. It offered a way to bridge the gap between the observable and the unobservable, between the external and the internal. 
and it opened up new avenues for understanding and influencing human behavior. Thus began the era of cognitive science promising a more comprehensive understanding of human behavior. So where does this leave us in our understanding of learning and behavior? We've journeyed through the world of operant conditioning, delving into its principles, applications, and impacts. We've seen how it has shaped behavior through rewards and punishments, with its influence extending to classrooms and workplaces. However, we've also noted its potential dangers, including dependency on external rewards and the risk of promoting manipulative behaviors. We've explored the realm of behaviorism, which emphasizes observable behaviors and dismisses thoughts and emotions. Yet we've also acknowledged its shortcomings, namely, its disregard for cognitive processes which play a vital role in learning. Then we ventured into the rise of cognitive science, a field that recognizes the importance of mental processes. This shift, driven by psychologists like Jean Piaget and Noam Chomsky, has led to a more holistic understanding of human behavior and learning. It underscores the significance of thinking, memory, and problem-solving in shaping our actions and decisions. In essence, both operant conditioning and cognitive science offer valuable insights into human behavior. They represent different facets of learning, each contributing unique perspectives. Operant conditioning helps us understand how behavior can be shaped by external factors, while cognitive science illuminates how our internal thought processes influence our actions. So, while operant conditioning and cognitive science may seem different, they are both crucial in shaping our understanding of human behavior and learning. And with that, we have come to the end of our journey. We hope this exploration into operant conditioning and cognitive science has sparked your curiosity. Remember, knowledge is an endless ocean, and there's always more to discover. Don't hesitate to dive deeper into these fascinating subjects on your own. Your quest for understanding is what makes learning a wonderful adventure. Thank you for joining us on this journey of learning. Until next time, keep exploring and keep learning. Welcome to our journey through the fascinating world of psychology. Today we're diving into the groundbreaking work of Edward Chase Tolman and his research on latent learning. Edward Chase Tolman was an American psychologist who made significant contributions to the study of learning and motivation. Born in 1886, Tolman was a key figure in the development of cognitive psychology. Tolman is most famous for his experiments with rats in mazes. But why study rats in mazes, you ask? Tolman conducted these experiments to understand the nature of learning. He challenged the behaviorist view that learning is merely a mechanical process of associating a stimulus with a response. Tolman's maze experiments with rats introduced a new concept. He placed rats in a maze and allowed them to explore without any rewards. After several days, he introduced a reward. What he found was astonishing. The rats quickly navigated to the reward, much faster than if they were learning from scratch. This suggested that they had formed a cognitive map of the maze even without a reward. A cognitive map is like a mental representation of the layout of one's environment. Tolman believed that the rats had developed this understanding of the maze during their unrewarded exploration. This led to the concept of latent learning learning that occurs without any obvious reinforcement and is not immediately demonstrated. Tolman's work was revolutionary. It challenged the prevailing behaviorist view and paved the way for the cognitive revolution in psychology. His research showed that learning can occur in the absence of direct reinforcement and that internal mental processes play a crucial role in learning. Edward Chase Tolman's work significantly altered our understanding of behavior highlighting the importance of cognitive processes in learning. His legacy lives on in the field of psychology, influencing how we think about learning and motivation today. Thank you for joining us on this exploration of Edward Chase Tolman's contributions to psychology.